<laughs> so I'm, uh, I'm Eric Klopfer. Uh, I'm at MIT. I also run the, the uh, Learning Games Network, a nonprofit that studies uh, learning games. And today what I'm going to talk about is uh, evolution in schools. I'm not going to talk about the bizarrely controversial kind, uh, but instead evolution of devices in schools and how those have changed over time and how that change has led to some progress but also some decline in terms of uh, we've moved students from the role of producers to the role of consumers using these devices and how we can get some of that production back into schools. So looking at this uh, lineage here of different devices over time, these were all found in my basement or actively used. Uh, and uh, we, we start out with some of the older desktop computers and we go to, to laptops and netbooks and ultimately a lot of schools are moving towards tablets now. And, uh, and that has been accompanied by a lot of positive change in that we don't necessarily need to be relegated to fixed computers in a computer lab where teachers are sort of brought out of their room and students are brought out of their room and you have sort of a very regimented way of working in a, a tightly compressed room with these devices. And so there's a lot of flexibility around that. But at the same time, we've also changed the kinds of input and the kinds of things we can do on these devices. And that's led to some, some decline, I think. So. Um, if we look at what's happened to learning at that same time, we've gone from a stage where this was what the, basically the only thing we could do on computers when we had them in schools. We could do logo, we could program, we could make things. And now we sort of approach those same topics on the devices we have today in a lot different way. We might have a video that teaches us about geometry instead of actively doing that geometry ourselves. And so it's a much more passive didactic way of learning the same kinds of things. At that same time, we've sort of gone from, we've gone through an evolution of tools, we've gone through Logo, we've gone through HyperCard, we've gone through Scratch now, which is, which is still actively a, a large community. Some of those still have communities in other ways as well. Um, but it, we're, we're sort of getting pushed more and more into the realm of devices that we are pushed to consumption instead of production. So if you look at the, the common hot selling devices, we look at media tablets that are really pushing different kinds of content at us which I noted the one common piece of content there is Angry Birds, which seems to be the hallmark for all platforms right now. It must run Angry Birds. Uh, and, uh, and today's kids, um, these are my kids nearly today, um, they, they, they take to this digital uh, media and they actually become active consumers of that. And left on their own, that's what they will do. They'll sort of come to these devices and they, they, are, they love to consume the media on these devices. And some of it is very productive. Um, but they still are missing a lot by if this is the only way that they can engage with that media. And so the question then is today, what should we be doing? How do we change those consumers of media into producers as well? How do we change them to think of this device as something they can be creative on? And I don't think the answer is to sort of put logo on this same devices here. It's not a matter of sort of figuring out the ways that we could do things before and just making them small and touch enabled so we can put them on a small screen and get, and get the kids to do this. It's really about thinking about what are the unique aspects of these devices, this way of interacting with the world and with each other that we can use to make kids creative and, and, and productive. So uh, I think about these following characteristics of these devices. Um, that make them somewhat unique um, and somewhat different from other computational media we've had before. And they're portable, that's one of the, the fairly obvious ones. We bring them around with us. Um, they involve social interactivity, so we're often sort of communicating with other people with them. Sometimes those people are in the same room with us, sometimes we're looking at them face to face, and sometimes they're around the world. They're context sensitive, so they know about where other devices are, they know where they are in the world, they know what rotation they are in, so they know things about uh, the context that they're existing. They're connected to the internet, they're connected to other people, and there's something deeply personal about it. It feels like it's my device, it's individual, and I have something that's associated with my identity on this device here. And so these combination of characteristics have led to two ways that I think people think about um, the way that they use mobile, mobile devices, the, the where and when of these devices. And that can be the more common one, which is anywhere and any time. The fact is I have this device with me, it can be on 24 seven, and I can use it anywhere and any time. I can use it when I'm uh, waiting in line for the bus or uh, in the library or when I see my friend in the hall and I can do games like some of the things we've done before uh, in that kind of world. Um, but it's also about here and now. What's special and unique about this place that I'm in right now? And it's about that context sensitivity of thinking about ways that we can use these mobile media to be aware of the, the context in which they exist and make that um, sort of digitally enhanced in, in interesting ways. So that's been the basis of a project uh, we've worked on uh, at MIT and with some partners at the Missouri Botanical Gardens uh, called Community Science Investigators. I think we're one of like a million projects that calls itself CSI at this point in time. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and this was a project that we, that an NSF funded project, and the idea behind this was we were going to engage students in science-based issues in their communities, 
Uh, and the way they were going to do that is they were going to study those issues with GIS and then uh, make games about those issues on, the, on their own personal devices and then educate the community and actually try to affect change through people playing these games on the devices in their community. So they might be studying health issues or environmental issues uh, and they study those issues and the way they express that understanding is through those devices. For a long time, we did that on standard desktop-based software. We have a new piece of software we've been working on. It's one of many that are, that are like this, that sort of approach this problem from different angles. Um, ours is called Tailblazer. The idea behind it is it's a web-based piece of software. Um, I, I know that many of you who have worked in schools know the, the challenges of actually getting schools to install software. Um, this is a matter, this is web deployed, so the students can kind of log on to a website and be able to make their games here. Um, and it's really about making games with this software. It's not just about making a scavenger hunt or making sort of a location-based web browser as a lot of other software like Scavenger or Foursquare are apt to do. It's about thinking what are the unique qualities of games that we can embed in these environments and how do we get kids to think about deeply and richly about these issues of games through these. It's about creating interesting decisions and considering those decisions and providing some feedback and illustrating that feedback to the user and ultimately modeling underlying systems. And that's a really important concept, and I think it's one thing that we do a little bit differently in our software than some others do. We do start with a, a map, a location-based map that sort of shows this is your location, and students can pull down their, their neighborhoods in lots of different fashions. And you can embed videos and characters and items in this space that people can interact with. But the important thing that we do is we also have a, a programming environment, and those of you that have seen Scratch or other kinds of um, block-based programming environment, this is yet another block-based programming environment. And the idea is you can model different behaviors for characters in this world, or model behaviors of, in this case, the underlying, this is an environmental simulation, where you're modeling an underlying phenomenon that's going on that people can actually sample from and change. And so it's a matter of thinking about what are the models that underlie the systems in the world that exists or the world that could exist. And then you get to play the games, and you play the games on phones, like Android phones here or iPhones, and you can actually play these games on location and make decisions, and the, the player of the game also has an interesting way to interact with, with the game and with other players playing the game. They can be multiplayer. Um, for example, one of the games that we did with a, with a group of students was a, game, a series of games called Food Finders. Food Finders was about uh, cr getting access to locally produced foods in your community. And so students studied about uh, local gardens and access to food in schools and access to food in, in, uh, in stores. And they made games about those. And we actually made a, a template so that people could play and make similar games in different places, but thinking about the local issues and the local relevance of each of those in their own communities. And so the games they ultimately made in a densely urban area and a suburban area and, a, and sort of a rural area were very different as they thought about the different access they had to those different things there. Um, Recently, we've, uh, we've expanded our, our portfolio of, of things we're doing in this space. We've uh, inherited uh, Android App Inventor from Google. It was a project that my colleague Hal Abelson started while he was at Google, and now it's recently come to MIT, where Mitch Resnick and Hal and I uh, have, have taken over this project. And it's, it's also about creating deeply personal, meaningful apps. And the interesting thing about apps, as opposed to applications, is they're not monolithic applications that do everything that you want. They're something that does something unique and personal and meaningful to you and maybe a small number of other people. You may recognize those people on the screen there from my earlier slide. This is an application where it's some, I can just sort of have pictures of my kids and I touch on them and they say things in their own voices to me. And it's something that's meaningful to me and maybe my mother and maybe my mother-in-law. And it's something that's, that's, that feels effective in that I've done that. If my mother could figure out how to use a smartphone, that is. <laughs> my mother-in-law, very good at it, though. <clears throat> and um, this is something that a lot of people have taken on, that they've been able to think about interesting ways that they can do this that are not computer scientists. This is a story that was about when App Inventor originally came out, about a, a student who's a creative writing student, but he took a class on app creation using App Inventor, and he was able to make an app that uh, was supposed to prevent people from texting while they were driving. Uh, and the, the interesting quote that I highlight there at the bottom is it's about the democratization of computer programming. It's not something that's for the high intellectual elite to do, it's something that everybody can do, and everybody can do things that are personal and meaningful to them. This idea has been, has been taken on um, here in, in Washington, D.C. This is Lachelle Hatley's uh, club that she's run for kids called Youth App Lab, where kids actually create apps as part of an after-school club. Uh, and every kid in this, they do, they do stuff with lots of different media, but in this case, they're doing stuff with App Inventor and creating apps, and each kid creates their own. Some of them actually are really useful and get into the marketplace. Other ones are just sort of useful to a small number of people. Um, but it's been something that was really powerful to them. 
And uh, so what, what I'm going to show you on the next slide is uh, Lachelle talking about the different waves of empowerment that the students go through as they make these apps, as they try to create them and share them with their friends and their family. The thrill uh, came in waves. Right. The first thrill of uh, excitement was, you know, first, wow, there's this world out there that um, we, int we introduced the students to called apps. And we gave them phones, and they were able to explore them. But it was kind of like this off in the distance. Oh, this is some game someone created. Um, but when they did the tutorials, it was like, wow, I did it. And I did it in a day. Um, the next wave came when they actually saw their own ideas actually come for, to fruition on the phone. And it was like, you know, maybe it didn't work the way they wanted, but it was their idea, it was their app, and they worked hard on it. The third wave came when their parents realized that, hey, my baby, you know, my seventh grader, my 10th grader has now just created an app. Also, uh, you know, a world that seems so far away. And so I think uh, constantly, I think I just got an email just yesterday uh, saying, I'm so proud, I'm finished, I'm finished. So uh, the, 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 the thrills is constantly coming coming uh, from all different directions. So of course, this is still stuff that's made on the desktop and deployed on a, on a mobile device. Uh, where we're hopefully going in the next uh, year or two is actually be able to do these all on one device, where we can create and deploy things all on the same device, tablets or, or phones or whatever they are. Um, so with that, I will conclude. Thank you. <laughs>